This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and It Never Got Quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam veteran and the Vietnam War. I'm your host Vic Kraft. The Vietnam War began over a half century ago when Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, giving then President Johnson extraordinary powers in dealing with the conflict in Southeast Asia. There were close to 9 million uniformed members of the United States Armed Forces who served during the Vietnam era, over 3 million of them being deployed to Southeast Asia. More than 58,000 were killed. Many people today either do not know about the war or have a vague recollection of it. As time goes on, more veterans of the war will pass away and the experiences and wisdom these people gain will be lost forever. This program is an attempt to capture some of those experiences so that we may benefit from them. Wars are fought by individuals. The grand strategies and political goals become meaningless to those who World War II cartoonist Bill Malden termed the benevolent and protective brotherhood of them what has been shot at. The domino theory is irrelevant when hot lead is flying past your head. We named this program It Never Got Quiet as most of us from the time we arrived in Vietnam to the time we left were never too far from the sounds of war. Some of us have never truly become rid of those sounds either. In this program and in future ones, we will talk story with a Vietnam veteran. We will explore their experiences, motivations, and how the war affected them, their family, and the life after the Nam. We begin with what we hope to be a, a long-running series here on the Vietnam War and in Think Tech Hawaii with what many would consider the most essential element in the prosecution of war, and that's the infantryman. Our first guest is Miles Nishimoto. Miles was attached to the 1st Air Cavalry in the Central Highlands between 1966 and 1967. Miles received the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart for wounds sustained in combat and was medically discharged from the Army after spending two and a half years at Tripler. Miles spent 11 months in country before being wounded. Welcome, Miles. Aloha. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> I'd kind of like to start off with, what did you do before you went into the service? Well, what had actually happened uh, right before I got drafted into the military, uh, I finally la landed a job as an apprenticeship uh, uh, program with the uh, heavy equipment mechanic. Mm -hmm. And at that time, my hobby was more or less pulling around with automobiles anyway. And I had this one passion uh, to build racing cars. So if you can imagine, whatever money I earned was all invested into my, my speed machine. <laughs> and uh, that continued to be a great, great hobby, I would say, as well as uh, doing my pastime. And uh, I really enjoyed it. So along came the draft and uh, plucked you from that experience to uh, sending you to the mainland. Yeah, and what had actually happened, we knew that the draft was going to come, mainly because of the fact that uh, there was a new order that increased the draft per month from practically zero to almost 30,000 uh, personnel per month. And this being the case, we says, hey, all our friends, we got together one afternoon, and he says, hey, so what are we going to do? We're going to wait for the draft, or we're going to volunteer? And majority of them says, hey, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to volunteer for the Army. The other guy says, well, maybe I might consider Army Reserve. The other guy said, well, Air Force is for me. And finally, when it came down to me, I said, you know what, guys? I think I'm going to wait for the draft, mainly because of my apprenticeship program. And by the time I'm done with it, hey, I can get drafted, go in there, serve two years. You guys are serving three to four years. By the time you get out, you're going to be surprised. I'll be home before you will. <laughs> it has started that way. Anyway. Uh, I was going to say, I look at the timeline, and then, uh, you were... Uh in country probably what a year after you were in, or less of a year after you were oh in yeah i think it was about five or six months and then you and spent 11 months in combat and then were wounded that's right and then spent two and a half years at tripler so that's correct you didn't get out before they did no <laughs> so long story short they came up to the hospital to visit me and he says hey miles are you still in the military <laughs> 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 so you know became uh well, but then, of course, I mean, on the other hand, friends are always great to have around. But uh, don't forget, we also made some new friends while being yeah. in the military and also being in Vietnam, you know? Yeah. So friends was uh, always part of my memories, huh? Go ahead. Yeah. So when you went through basic training and uh, AIT, or uh, Advanced Infantry Training, uh, you went through, I think you went, started at Fort Ord for your basic? 
Yeah, I studied in Fort Ord, uh, California. That was a basic training. And uh, if you can imagine um, being a, a typical local boy from the islands, uh, being adjusted to military life was not an easy task for me, mainly because I felt that the military was very um, organized and that wasn't my style. And But after a couple of Article 15s, I said, you know what, I better start paying attention and start being able to change my ways to adapt to the military ways, otherwise I'm not going to graduate. I'm going to be out of the military, you know? Well, we ought to explain to the audience what an Article 15 is. That's part of the Universal Code of Military Justice. Uh, an article in there, it's a disciplinary action, but uh, yeah. I never expected that from you, Miles. Oh, my God. Like I said, I did have my challenges with the military when I first joined. <laughs> but then, of course, everything worked out pretty well. I was able to graduate in my class. And, uh, you know, being at Fort Ord, it was a different experience, too, because at that time, uh, they had that meningitis crisis. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine, Southern, I mean, in Fort Ord, California, it was already cold, and in the evenings, we had to sleep with the windows open, and wow, I mean, it's quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were a few guys that came down with meningitis, and, uh, but I was one of the fortunate ones, so everything worked out well. And thereafter, um, upon graduation, I was transferred to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And Fort Polk, Louisiana, as you can imagine, was uh, more for the advanced infantry training and jungle warfare training. And that by itself was a new experience too, mainly because like being a, a local boy from Hawaii, uh, you know, Hawaii is more like the melting pot. We've got a lot of different ethnicity here and uh, we all got along. And uh, being over in uh, Louisiana, my first experience that I've uh, experienced was like, wow, you know, there was so much segregation going on between the blacks and the whites. and we couldn't believe it that uh, one afternoon while going out to the uh, uh, PX to have a beer, all of a sudden we see this one car driving on the sidewalk and we see the blacks jumping over the hedges. We thought, what in the hell is that, you know? But this was, that was more or less like our first, first exposure to, hey, this is what has been happening here in the uh, mainland US. And if you can imagine now, that was what, just a little more than 50 years ago, so there has been tremendous changes as far as attitudes and acceptance and being able to live together, I would say. You know, so all in all, it's, it's a good story, Bob, yeah. but yeah. for us, it was quite an experience. Yeah, I can imagine. So from uh, Fort Polk, uh, I, I remember some of the stories of guys going over by ship. Uh, I don't know if you're one of the lucky ones that went in a stretch eight or... <laughs> now, what had happened was when we received our orders to go to Vietnam, uh, we shipped out from uh, Oakland. Mm -hmm. And Oakland was more like the repo depot, uh, repo depot. At which time, rather than going by ship, though, we flew out. There was uh, more like a chartered flight. Yeah. And we were fortunate because we got there pretty fast instead of the ship. You know? <laughs> Otherwise, my tenure would have been that much longer right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, we got into the country and uh, I was assigned to the 1st Air Cav Division, which was in the Central Highlands in An Khe, Vietnam. And uh, boy, that was uh, home of the 1st Air Cav Division. And uh, it was really quite an experience to be attached to the 1st Air Cav. Well, I remember uh, you telling me one of your first assignments was uh, with a fire team or in a platoon. Uh, you were the M60 carrier. Yes. And the M60 is, uh, we discussed it as the uh, grand piano of uh, the concert orchestra in terms of uh, combat weapons. That's correct. And it is a heavy son of a gun. Oh, it sure is. <laughs> but then, of course, I mean, uh, even if it was heavy, I mean, when you looked at the amount of firepower that you could have out of the weapon there, it was really remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, I mean, I'm sure glad that every one of the platoon members or the squad members helped carry with the ammunition, and I didn't have to carry the whole thing with myself. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been a problem. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, um, from there, uh, from being a, a machine gunner, and uh, I got a chance to take over as a squad leader. And uh, from the squad leader's position, um, it became part of our responsibilities to also participate in the uh, long range uh, reconnaissance uh, patrol, which they called the LERPs. And uh, we all had uh, special training on that. and. Uh, we were able to select a team 
to go out into enemy territory to do some reconnaissance. And uh, it was really quite an experience, uh, quite exhausting, if I must say, because, boy, spending some uh, sleepless nights, you know, just worrying about your people there with uh, responsibilities that, even at a young age, it was quite tough to cope with, mm -hmm. you know. But I'm glad everything worked out all right, though, you know. Well, you participated in uh, a couple of significant uh, battles, if you want to call them battles. Yeah. I know that, uh, uh, were you in the second battle of Yadrang? No, uh, Yadrang battle was the first one was in November of 1965. Uh -huh. And that was, uh, the one battle that they had a movie on. Yeah. And uh, by the time we came in, we were more like the replacements of uh, those who lost their lives there and got injured. And, uh, but then of course, we also went back to Idrang for a couple of times. And Idrang is the um, uh, name of that valley, if I remember correctly, it was mm -hmm. like the Valley of the Dead. Right. And it was a funny feeling when you got there, you know, it's uh, eerie. But, uh, Yes, we did have uh, several firefights in there, but uh, we lost a few. But again, I was uh, very fortunate to have been able to uh, survive. <coughs> and at the time, I didn't get wounded or anything. I was one of the very few that made it back. And when talking about battles, I mean, there were other battle uh, areas that we participated with in the right outside of Pleiku and uh, the Bong Song, Happy Valley, and all of which was uh, quite an experience, though, you know, because. When we first got in country, uh, we didn't really understand the purpose of why we're down here. But then our company commander one day shared uh, the beliefs or the objectives as to why we are there, we were there, and it was mainly to uh, stop the invasion of communism from the north into the south. And I'm pretty sure there was much more to that. However, that was the only reason that we kind of understood from the simple layman's language basis that hey, that was basically our purpose. But as I mentioned, <clears throat> while I was stationed in Fort Ord, uh, I was really exposed to the type of segregation that they had. But while I was in Vietnam, I gotta admit one thing. Our leaders in Vietnam were tremendous leaders. Uh, they clearly explained the real purpose of why we as soldiers need to look at each other and support each other. And even if a person gets wounded, it is our responsibility to make sure that, hey, we're going to do our ultimate best to bring that person back to the lines and making sure that uh, we can accommodate his need for medevac and everything else. So I think the idea of getting close with uh, our comrades was uh, a key lesson that was learned. And I think those experiences of uh, being able to interact with others has been uh, a very good key learning something that uh, you're going to remember for the rest of your life. And even those that we had lost, good friends, good comrades, I mean, it was very, very hard to accept. However, you know, uh, there was never a dull moment that made you think and dwell on those periods. So uh, I, for one, I can be extremely, extremely uh, happy of the fact that I was able to cope with the changes, cope with the circumstances, and also looked at different ways that we could still contribute to our comrades. That by itself was something that is going to be uh, with me for the rest of my life. Yeah. Why don't we go ahead and uh, take a quick break here and we'll be right back with uh, Miles Nishimoto. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Uh. Nice wig, man. I could play, so any chance to play at all. You know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, that's how we do it. Aloha, welcome to Hawaii. This is Prince Dykes, your host of the Prince of Investing, coming to you guys each and every Tuesday at 11 a.m. right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Don't forget to come by and check out some of the great information on stocks, investings, your money, all the other great stuff, and I'll be your host. See you Tuesday. My friend, mother, what big eyes you have. She said, all the better to see you with, my dear. That's the wolf. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, ah. yeah this is the starting line. Push. Ah. 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 When the 
this is over. You're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Hi, welcome back to It Never Got Quiet. Uh, we're here with Miles Nishimoto and we're talking about uh, his experiences in Vietnam. Miles, we, we kind of left you there uh, with, uh, you were talking about the leadership and the quality of the people there. Uh, I think that you had a great life lesson. We've discussed this before. Uh, I don't want to bring back any hard memories or bad memories, but uh, Miles and I belong to a group that's uh, sponsored by the Veterans Administration. It's uh, out at the West Oahu Vet Center. Uh, and it's a very, it's where the rubber meets the road as far as getting in touch with veterans. Uh, and that's how Miles and I got to know each other. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent program, and uh, we get together on Monday nights. And uh, you held us spellbound one night with one of the stories that you had. And I don't know if that was from your experience when you were wounded or if it was from some other engagement. But uh, uh, when you ended the story, we were just, uh, everybody was silent. We couldn't say anything. Mm -hmm. And it was very emotional. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to bring that up, but uh, I will bring up the, the business of you going to the hospital after you were wounded. Uh, as we said, we were joking about it and saying, yeah, the, the guys who got wounded most were the ones who first came in country or the ones that are about to leave country. That's correct. You got lucky. I got lucky. <laughs> you were the one that was about to leave country <laughs> 21 days before you de -roast. That's correct. That's <laughs> yeah. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, as I mentioned about the comradeship and the, uh, the relationship that we built over the period of time that we've been in Vietnam together, I can still vividly remember the day that I got shot. And uh, when I came to, I knew I needed a tunicate because I could see part of my arm was down and my other half of my arm was up in the air. And at that moment, I asked my, uh, my buddy there, hey, by the way, help me out, I need a tunicate. And when he turned to me and he saw what was happening to my arm and he started crying. And uh, he mentioned that, you know, pineapple was in this in first aid class. I don't know how to make a tunicate. I said, you know what? I'll talk you through it. And uh, slowly but surely, I talked him through it, and it was very patient. And I had this excruciating pain and everything else, but yet I didn't really want to put him into a panic. And I think because of him, I, my life was saved, mainly because of the fact that I never went into shock. And because I had to talk him through the procedures, and after that I thanked him for it, he felt so glad that, wow, I saved their life, you know. And even when I was ready to leave, <clears throat> he came up to me and uh, he thanked me for uh, talking him through that procedure. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's just exactly like what I was saying. I mean, those are some of the, uh, the moments that you kind of uh, cherish a lot, you know, yeah. knowing that, uh, here it is, a person from San Antonio, Texas, and here's another guy from Honolulu, Hawaii. The only time we met was in, uh, in, the, in the war and how we became close. But yet, it didn't matter what nationality you were. And basically, the leaders had always mentioned about making sure that we tend to the needs of our comrades. And that was one example, you know. So I'm really, really uh, grateful for that. Very grateful. No. I know you spent two and a half years at Tripler, and uh, that had to have been uh, a heck of an experience uh, that a lot of us, I don't think, would want to yeah. experience. But uh, <coughs> I know that afterwards, uh, you had your mindset and what you wanted to do, and uh, I know you've been successful in, uh, in business and uh, as a parent, and uh, you've got two great kids and, uh, in, in a professional uh, capacity. Uh, but. Do you think your military experience had anything to do with that <coughs> as far as what, what direction you took? I, I personally uh, contribute a lot of my successes to what I've learned in the military. And for example, while a patient in a hospital, if you can imagine right after the Tet Offensive, that hospital was absolutely full. They even had beds in the hallway. Mm -hmm. So this being the case now, the amount of help that the hospital needed was insufficient. They had some uh, volunteer nurses from the outside seven in a row coming down to help out. And I, for one, 
uh, I was fortunate that I had my significant other to come in there and uh, wash down my wounds and making sure that it's uh, properly clean. And uh, the funny thing about all the help and support that we needed, especially with the, the other uh, patients in the hospital, knowingly that they went into surgery at certain sort of time this morning, knowing about approximately what time they're coming out, we all made at a point that, hey, somehow, what are we not wrong? wheelchair or uh, somebody can push us on the bed or whatever, we're going to be there when they come back to, uh, to welcome them and to congratulate them that, hey, the surgery went all right, you know. And I think more like a, a morale booster. And I think that by itself had helped a lot of the veterans to really uh, recover mm -hmm. and still look at their, their lives on a very positive basis. But I think that by itself has also been uh, a key learning for me, and uh, even when I got out of the military and uh, started uh, with my business, uh, that by itself always helped me to understand exactly who people are, uh, what must we do to conti uh, continuously help them to develop themselves, to have the patience, of course, and to really thank them. What is what is so hard to thank them for a job well done? In this crucial day and age, you know, right now is everything is a hustle bustle. Businesses got their own personal challenges. And one of the things that I think a lot of the leaders fail to realize is, hey, how to treat people the way they would want to be treated. And I think this by itself, uh, part of the learnings that I've had in the military about helping each other, uh, I would say was a good lesson learned and has lasted a lifetime with me anyway. So those are some of the um, skills and knowledge that I, I stated that I needed to uh, continuously try to improve on them. So what is it that you would like people to remember or learn from our experiences in Vietnam? <clears throat> well, I think um, when I look at today's um, existing uh, situation across the country, People always say that it's really quite divided. But you know, when you really think about it, Vic, back in 1965, it was also divided. Mm -hmm. I still remember when I first came back home, and I didn't have no, we didn't have no welcoming committee. We didn't have no parades. If anything, there was uh, riots going on, even at the local university. And we were known as baby killers and otherwise, you know. And it was just a, a funny feeling like, Wow, why is it like this? Now, compared to yesteryear and what is happening right now, truthfully, what is the big difference? It's the opinions of others, I think, that is uh, created this dividedness. But until such time that we can continue to look at how do we make things better, it starts with us, no matter how you look at it, you know. And just like what I mentioned, just imagine, a little more than 50 years ago, there were segregation. And look at it today. I mean, we're past that. But now it's different circumstances. So again, I think you know, that's become some of the key things that we all need to realize that everything will happen, but how do we adapt towards accepting the changes and trying to overcome those things? You know, I think that becomes something that we all need to be working ourselves to being committed to doing. That's great. Yeah. What else do you think we can learn from this? Well, I think the, the other good things about it is, you know, people will always give you the dismal side of any situation that a war may bring on, failing to realize that, you know, I can still reminisce back and, wow, we had some good times too, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, just the idea of being able to be in, out together out in a field and like that local to say, talking story, and uh, being able to kind of uh, understand what is it for this guy who is living in New York? I mean, what was so different about his lifestyle versus my lifestyle here in Hawaii? But you know, there were a lot of similarities after all, you know? And the good thing is that, wow, I'm pretty sure uh, I was fortunate and I just uh, hope that they were also fortunate that they were not able to dwell on things. They were able to look forward and 
kind of get over that, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I know it's a it's a problem for a lot of people, but or a lot of comrades. But uh, you can see that the VA now we have so many different uh, support and help, and like for the here and now group at Kapolei under the leadership of Ed De Guzman, I mean, wow, you know, he is a terrific servant of the uh, the veterans, and I for one gotta admit that. This is one person who goes above and beyond, and just imagine now, he doesn't have to do it. No, he doesn't. But he just uh, enjoys doing it to help the veterans out. And you know, there aren't enough people like him, really, Vic. Well, what I was trying to get at is I think that uh, a lot of us have lost a sense of service, or at least those who haven't served in the service. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, we, we look at our generation and what we were faced with, uh, I was drafted twice, once when I was in basic training, the other time when I was in Vietnam. Oh. So it was, my number came up, but whatever. I, I look at it and think of the things that we, we take from there and what we learned yep. and what we can bring into the community. Uh, it's that sense of service. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know that you have that sense of service mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have brought it uh, not only to uh, <coughs> work but in your life mm -hmm. and you brought it to the rest of us and I mean that's our contact with one another mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, I want to thank you for that because uh, you've enriched my life in that way and I appreciate that oh so, terrific I yeah. appreciate it yeah <clears throat> but you know like the last thing maybe I can close with is that sometimes we take things for granted uh, and we look at our success story oh it's like wow you know I became successful because of me failing to realize that uh, you know We've got uh, significant others that we should be very thankful about because my significant others, being the fact that I did a lot of traveling because of my international business, she was always there to act as a mother as well as a father. And I still remember this one occasion I came back from Japan and my wife told me, hey, you better go start throwing some ball with your son, man. I enrolled him in Little League Baseball. Oh, yeah, fine. So I get out there and says, hey, Tom, let's throw some ball. So he throws the ball back to me and says, hey, by the way, who's teaching you how to throw a ball? You're throwing it like a girl, you know? And he says, mom. <laughs> 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 but again, that's the reason why I'm saying, you know, uh, behind every, every person there's always a, a greater person. So I was fortunate. Yeah. That, is, that is something that we tend to forget is uh, the support that we receive from family. And, yeah. uh, and I know uh, it's, it's caused a lot of friction in a lot of different people. We've seen divorce rates and sure. uh, a lot of uh, spousal abuse and things of that nature. But uh, and one of the things that we try to do is enlist a lot of the kids from the Iraq uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and so that they don't make the same mistakes that we did. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. I would like to thank uh, the staff here at Think Tech Hawaii and their support and assistance. And truly, without them, there would be no never got a uh, it never got quiet. I'd also like to put in a, a little bit of a, uh, a pitch for uh, a uh, photo uh, exhibit that's at uh, Fort De Rossi right now. Uh, it ends at the end of the month, or the 31st of August. Uh, if you're interested in some of the uh, photos, it's at the U.S. Army Museum. Uh, very historical and uh, very interesting. And I believe it's all free, too. It's just a donation if you want to leave a dollar at the door. So thank you very much for being with us. Hope to see you again here next week.